This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Franny's Pharmacy. Now more than ever, it's important that our society focuses more on our mental and physical health. At Franny's Pharmacy, the team is committed to their community's need of being happy, healthy, and stress-free. Come learn how Franny's Pharmacy can assist you in a clean, professional environment with their expert bud tenders that are excited to educate you about the benefits of their lab-tested, DEA-certified CBD products. Franny's Pharmacy also offers wholesale and franchise opportunities. Visit their website at frannyspharmacy.com, and that's pharmacy with an F, and use the promo code CANACONNECT10 for an exclusive Cannabinoid Connect discount. Again, that's Franny's Pharmacy with an F dot com. And use the promo code CANACONNECT10 for an exclusive Cannabinoid Connect discount. Franny's Pharmacy, putting the farm back into pharmacy. Chris, a.k.a. Gramps. How you doing, sir? I'm doing good. How about yourself, Kevin? I'm doing well. It's really uh, great to have you on. And it it was a pleasure meeting you finally in person for the first time during the Texas Roundup cannabis event uh, that we that we had last week, which, man, it had a really great turnout. Yeah, I was I was impressed with the turnout they had. That was that was awesome. Yeah. And I know that you you know, you're heavily involved within the Texas hemp community, serving as treasurer of the Texas Cannabis Collective. Uh, And you're also the creator of Something Has to Change and Now. Uh, So, you know, big, big advocate, Chris, uh, for, you know, the accessibility of both hemp and cannabis, which is great. Absolutely. Uh, Feel like it's uh, a calling, so to speak, uh, in in many ways, uh, since I've gotten involved, it's just, Seems like it's where I need to be. Yeah. And, and, you know, I really appreciate when we did meet during that event, you know, you really talked about really what led you here. Right. And kind of exactly like why this is your mission at this point in life to really advocate for the plan and ensure that people that need it uh, get access to it. And, you know, Chris, before we, you know, dive into that story, which is, super compelling and, and authentic, of course, you know, coming from you, the person who lived through it, um, and, and, you know, dealing with your son and his, his, uh, seizures and whatnot that he encountered, let's first take a step back, you know, and just quickly talk about you, your relationship with cannabis prior to, um, you know, all that went on with your son. And then we can kind of take it from there. Okay, we want to open up the history book, in other words. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's, let's open up the, the Gramps history book. <laughs> well, uh, I was actually born in the northern Midwest. Uh, believe it or not, you can't tell from my accent because we were I was 15 months old when the family moved us to Texas. But uh, I was born in a small suburb of Chicago, Illinois, as a matter of fact. <laughs> But uh, we made our way to Texas, obviously, for various reasons, one being that I was born with asthma and I already had an older brother who who had severe asthma and they dealt with that. My parents, of course, dealt with that in the, the extreme cold winters of, of northern Illinois. And, and when I was born, they said, you know, we don't want to do this again. <laughs> you know, we're still dealing with this one, so... They, that my dad basically uh, switched companies. He worked for the telephone company uh, for many, many years. He worked for General Telephone up in Illinois. He came to work in Texas for, for Southwestern Bell or what was just Bell Telephone back in the day before the government made them split and we got AT&T and Southwestern Bell, right? But anyway, we grew up in a little town uh, north of Van Alstine or north of Dallas, called Van Alstine, Texas. And a uh, little, little hick town. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or not, because no. it's just recently starting to become something on the map. Uh, I think it's been going back and forth in one of the fastest growing cities in the country for the last couple of years uh, in terms of population. But it's really blowing up now. At any rate, we grew up on a little, little small eight-acre farm and uh, I had three older brothers and an older sister. I'm the youngest of five kids, right? So I had a lot of things to watch growing up, right? 
And of course, my oldest brother, uh, this will be the first time I've ever publicly told this story, but my oldest brother back when they were in school and I was like four or five years old, you know, I wasn't in school yet. Kindergarten was or wasn't a requirement back then, right? So uh, basically, they would go to school. I had free reign of the house all day long. So I would go in Big Brother's bedroom and listen to his eight tracks all day, <laughs> right? And and one of the, my favorite ones was uh, the Edgar Winter Group. You can, and you know how you could listen to it. I don't know if you know or not. You might not be old enough. But you could listen to an eight track, one track skip two tracks forward and then listen to a track and then skip, go back to the original channel you were on. Cause you know, eight track had four channels, right? Uh -huh. Where the eight track came in. I, I never did understand that <laughs> whole concept, but you could skip back to that first channel you were on and hear the same song that you heard the first time on that channel again. So I would listen to Frankenstein and free ride over right. and over and over again all day long. Well, unbeknownst to me, little kid, you know, I'm innocent, right? I didn't know back then, you know, the stereos were all old flat little boxes, wooden boxes with the components on a metal tray that you'd take four screws out of the sides and you could slide the components out of the, the wooden box, right? I didn't know he had the screws out and had it where he could pull that, that tray of components out of the, the box stash, stash had, box. <laughs> you got it he was, <laughs> he was putting his stash right on top of the eight track tape player which of course is where the motor and the pulleys and everything were so Too you smart. know what i was you know what i was doing to his stash right <laughs> <laughs> you were experimenting of course <laughs> well un unbeknownst to myself but i was just destroying his bag and it was going scattering the you know his, his weed all through his stereo so he'd come yeah. home he knew who did it. <laughs> I mean, You're the only nobody, one there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, I was probably, I guess, five when he sat me down like fourth or fifth time that happened. He said, you're going to learn why I get so damn mad, you know, and he made me take a couple of hits. <laughs> and I sat there and I was like, OK, I get it. Five you years know? old. Damn. Yeah, I was five years old when I took a couple first couple of hits. I mean, I never did, didn't start smoking and all that. You know, right, right. It was just you tried it. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, he'd give me a couple of little small puffs, and I don't even remember if I inhaled it at that point, like you would, you know, today, <laughs> right? But right, uh, I didn't touch the stuff again for uh, well, till my senior year of high school was the next time. What and, what compelled you back? I mean, to, to try it again. I mean, obviously, the first time you tried it, I mean, it, it was, was probably some, amazing, you know, and or different experience. Did some you, of it was boredom? Yeah. Uh, some of it was uh, peer pressure, you know. Uh, some of it was uh, I think the biggest part of it was the boredom factor because uh, my my lovely wife, who I'm married to today, was also my high school sweetheart. And, uh, but she was a year older than I was, or she is a year older than I am. And, uh, she, of course she graduated high school. So in my senior year, she's gone off to college, you know? And so I was bored. I didn't, you know, the boredom set in, I think more than anything. And of course, right. then other girls got interested. So I ended up breaking it off with her, just went down a whole different path, you know, completely and totally different direction from where I was headed right because the next thing happened was she started dating other people which oh well, that was just nah we can't do that right which like I had any room to say anything there <laughs> you know but right I mean 17 year old kid what do you know right right yeah you don't know much at that age no sure. no but uh it, long and the short of it was uh it was there at the right time. And so was I, you know, once again, it was with family when, when I started, you know, the first couple of times. And then I went to a uh, deep purple concert when, when they came, got back Smoke together. Smoke on the water. <laughs> yeah. And there was plenty of that. Let me tell you <laughs> now, uh, the, the, that was the year, uh, the perfect strangers to her when they first got back together after 10 or 11 years of being debunked. Right. Uh, but 
but went to that concert with a different crowd of friends, even than the last path I went down, which was even further in that same direction. Right. So. Uh, so basically, I mean, from there, it just kind of evolved. It became kind of part of the, the scene and the people that you were hanging out with recreation. You guys were just kind of, it was just something that you, that you consumed. Right. I mean, in the, yeah, I mean, the people that you it, hung out with. It was no different than alcohol, right. you know, it, to, to any of us at that point. I mean, right. It didn't lead to anything else, uh, like like so many people want to say, uh, and and I didn't get in any trouble. I didn't stop doing my schoolwork. When I got out of school, I went straight into college, uh, worked as an EMT for a year. Jeez. You know, anybody that wants to say that first responders don't take that with them and have the same type of uh, PTSD issues and whatnot that that military personnel have. I'll be the first one to tell you, you don't know what you're talking about. Right. I, I mean, I'm always fascinated with those those human beings, right? The people that are on the front lines, the EMTs, like, I mean, you're seeing someone's worst night or, or a group of people's worst night every night or every day, right? Yeah. I mean, Everything you see is someone's worst moment. Right, exactly. Which yeah, is, yeah. I mean, you have to be a certain kind of person to deal with that type of stress. But to your point, I mean, we're all human at the end of the day. And I, I would imagine that stuff carries on. Um, yeah. I mean, well, is I, mean that, I, I was going to say, is that one way that maybe you've how, you've coped with cannabis has, you know, I mean, obviously that was a, a while from when you've done that. But was that kind of one outlet at that time that you? I, I would have to say uh, unbeknownst you know, unconsciously that it was, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, it was, and I didn't know it is, is the better way to say it, but I went down another path through employment. I want to get to the part where, yeah, cause you, you know, when I talked to you, you mentioned that you, you, you were a regular cannabis user and you, you, you know, that was something that you used to relax, but then you learned about the medicinal properties of cannabis, you know, with the, of course, the experience of your son, but was, was there any point before we get to that part with your son or, you know? Yeah, like uh, uh, that's what I was just fixed to say. Uh, I got to work at that Magwell plant, started making a ton of money at 19, living at home with mom and dad, right? I had, at one time I had three vehicles. Uh, just, <laughs> you, you see the cartoons with the money falling out of your pockets as you're walking down the street. That was me. I just was, crazy with it and then i met uh we had a company party and i met one of the engineers in the front office i didn't know any about any of the front office people because i was working the night shift so i met one of those engineers at the party and he said hey man he said he said i know you you smoke weed and i said yeah sure he said well well come here i thought we were going to go off in the bushes and burn one you know we go off in the bushes and he pulls out one of those little pocket rockets, little cocaine rocket, you know, little, uh -oh. yeah, little, yeah. little one hitter. Little you bullet. Know? Yeah. 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 So <clears throat> I thought, what the hell? I mean, I'd snorted a little coke before, you know, so I snorted a little with him. I said, it's not really my thing, but you know, so I did a little and one thing led to another. Meanwhile, all this other was still going in my head from previous crap. Right. So one thing led to another. And uh, I went down that road pretty hard and heavy uh, with the cocaine. A little, little bit of snorting turned into a little bit of free basin on one Saturday night, which turned into free basin every day. You know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, that went on for about about a year and a half to the point of where I was I was not only using but I was selling trafficking i mean i was doing the whole ball of wax right and the way i gave it up was i quit that job i sold everything i had gave a lot of money away and i sat at my mom and dad's house for a year and did nothing except smoke weed was didn't, didn't go to rehab didn't didn't do anything 
and you because you already knew initially from your experience that this was something that calmed you it was just part of your lifestyle right and you didn't see it as like a hardcore drug like like you're freebasing or if you're you know doing bumps all day right no no it was when i got that to that moment where i felt like i wasn't gonna make it you know where where it's like ants in your pants is, is the description i like to use uh but it's that jones and feeling you know <clears throat> And uh, I had the, the luck that my older brother lived in a trailer park exactly two miles down the road. So I could go knock on his door and he'd burn one with me. You know, I didn't have to have my own. Right, right. You know, but I get to that moment, I'd go, go down the road and I'd smoke one with the older brother. And then I'd go back home and I was good. And I mean, after being off of those hard, harder drugs, I would imagine like that's uh, at that point you felt because you, you made it, you know, your own decision. Hey, I'm going to work to get off those. And then when you consume cannabis, I'm sure it's like, man, this is all I need. I mean, I feel good. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. So, I mean, how long did you were you at your parents consuming cannabis, you know, before you kind of made the next move and, and kind of, you know, took ownership of what was going on? Well, the, the next move I made was I applied for a job after that year and a half with a warehouse, local warehouse right there close by where we live, turned out to be the headquarters for a, a major retail company. Uh, two months into working for them, they, they promoted me to assistant store manager, moved me to Alabama from Texas. And the, the, I went from Alabama to South Carolina to San Diego, California, back to Houston. Uh, uh, California and Houston was both as a store manager, worked for them for five and a half years. But uh, by that point in time, I got married with the mother of my children, uh, had my oldest child, and uh, didn't like that I couldn't spend any time with them. So I had an opportunity to go to work in sales, uh, did that, which they moved us back here to north central texas which was another plus to that job offer the wife wanted the hell out of houston because <laughs> you got to understand this was uh 89 90 91 when we were in houston houston was a lot worse than it is today <laughs> right. different different yeah for sure. totally different uh demographic than it is today but uh at any rate uh, when we came back up here, I worked for that chemical company. It was, it was a household chemical company that, that offered me the job and moved me up here. And uh, 15 months after, uh, I went to work for them and moved back up here, got their products on the shelves. It's, oh, we don't need you anymore. Sales distributor reps can, can order the product now that it's on the shelves. You know, you did your job. And you had done that whole move and, and. Oh yeah. Uh, I had just had my youngest son three weeks before they came, flew to DFW, had me pick him up like a regular going to ride with me for the week, you know, meet it, meet up. And when he came out of the airport gate with nothing but a briefcase in his hand, no suitcase, I knew right then what was up. Oh, man. <coughs> Yeah, so when that happened, I thought, well, shoot. Uh, I'm in my mid-20s. I've done a lot of things and been successful, several of them, but I've got nothing to fall back on, really. My college education is something I'm never going to do again. Uh, so I need a trade, is what I thought. So I went to work in construction. Commercial drywall, acoustical ceilings, you know, metal for metal stud framing, the whole bit. And I've been doing that for going on 35 years now. Wow. So, and then that's kind of where you grounded <coughs> it, back here in the DFW area. Um, and you just kind of found your way within the construction industry. And I mean, is that the start to really like, you know, raising the family? And well, the wife, uh, the mother of my kids that I mentioned, you know, she married the, the, the suit and tie wearing nice haircut shaves every day, 
doesn't have a foul mouth, you know, uh, clean cut, or goes to the office every day, day type guy. And now I come home. Granted, she I was home more, but that wasn't necessarily a positive thing because I was different. You right, know what I mean? Right, right. Uh, because now I could let the mouth run wild because I'm on the construction sites, you know. I'm getting dirty. I wear nasty jeans and t-shirts every day. I don't, I don't suit up with the tie. I don't shave every day. You know, I can tell for those that aren't watching the video, Gramps has a big beard here. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty impressive, man. But so let's, let's, I mean, let's switch gears. So you've told us about your background and kind of what led you to where you're at today, you know, working construction and, and raising your family in the DFW area. And, and it's, and it's all interesting. And I love the fact that you talked about, you know, that one period in your life where it, things got tough, you know, you fell down a bad path, you, you know, you, you became addicted to, you know, the cocaine, the freebasing, and you found relief and actual getting off the addiction through cannabis, which you kind of went back to your roots. I mean, that's something yeah. that you, you used, you know, every day. And so I'm really interested to talk to you about, you know, really why you are here today within the, the Texas cannabis community, why you're such an advocate for the plan. And you, you told me a little bit about it when we were at the Texas roundup sure. event. Um, so let's dive into that. I mean, tell me about everything, you know, about your, your son's epilepsy and how you sought after, you know, traditional healthcare treatments and whatnot. And, and that whole experience, I mean, it's pretty shocking kind of the revelations of what you found out. Absolutely. Uh, well, at the point where we were, you know, we, of course, went our separate ways because things didn't work out between the missus and I. So I was down to uh, getting the kids just on the weekends, right? Which I was adamant. I got them every weekend. So I could be very, very involved in their lives and whatnot. Because they were, I mean, William, at the time we got divorced, he was three. So that's the scenario we lived with. And then I got remarried uh, shortly after. Uh, and then when it, it was, William was about nine when uh, we had picked him up on a Friday night, we had dinner and watched some movies and then everybody went to bed, right? Saturday mornings, of course, you know, working in construction, I, I was used to getting up at four o'clock in the morning every morning. So sleeping in on Saturday is okay, four thirty, five o'clock, right? <laughs> <laughs> So I'd always get up, wander around. Uh, I was a big, heavy cigarette smoker back then. So I'd go outside, smoke me two or three cigarettes, come back in, turn on the TV, lay down on the couch. One particular Saturday morning, uh, did just that. And then, you know, I kind of dozed back off and uh, woke up to William had come into the living room, which William's my youngest son. I don't know if you see the picture of him behind me here i see it yeah uh um, litter skinner <laughs> he's wearing a litter skinner shirt <clears throat> yeah it was my been my favorite band growing up and it was one of his too um uh, but uh he used to get up saturday morning he was the first kid up every every weekend morning and he'd always go out to the living room turn on the tv and turn on the playstation start playing that that was just his routine right and I woke up and I noticed he was there, you know, kind of one eye because I'm laying down on the couch. And, uh, you know, he turned around and looked and said, hey, dad, you know, I said, hey, William. And then I kind of dozed back off as he played, you know. And uh, I don't know if it was five minutes, 10 minutes, or if it was 20 minutes that went by, but I was awakened by a very strange noise. Uh, that turned out to be him laid out in front of the coffee table in what was his first full grandma seizure, uh, which was a shocker to say the least. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of course I freaking lost it. Uh, training gone. <laughs> Nine years old, right? <laughs> Nine years old. Uh, and just to see your kid like that, uh, completely out unconscious. And I mean, he wasn't just shaking, he was thrashing in the floor. Uh, and of course we called the ambulance. They came by the time they got there. Cause we lived out in the country. 
by the time they got there, uh, he was he was out of it, but he still didn't know where he was or who he was. Uh, but a very, very scared little kid, you know. Uh, we, of course, took him to the hospital. They did an MRI and CAT scan that day. Didn't see anything on any of that. So we made a follow-up appointment with a neurologist. And uh, they did EEGs and a couple other little, little nerve tests and whatnot. And basically told us that he has absolutely no signs of epilepsy whatsoever. So, uh, and I forget now, I was going to look it up before we got on here, but I forgot. I forget now the term they use, but there's a term for a group of kids. And this is the way they explained it to us. So it may be right. It may be wrong. Uh, but this is the way they explained it to us. There's a group of kids around the age of 10 who will manifest what appears to be epilepsy and will have seizures. And then they grow out of it around the age of 14. And so because this was his first seizure, because there were no indicators, there were no growths or aneurysms or no abnormalities of any kind, that was the path we took. We're going to wait and see, basically. And so, uh, ironically, we thought we were in the clear because 18 months went by before he had another one. Hmm. and uh he was at school when he had this one so wow <clears throat> yeah so the the environment was different you know uh, antagonists were all completely different uh everything was different so was it worse was it a worse seizure uh, no it was basically the same you know full grand mall uh, a good uh two to three minutes out so and then, of course, a good 15 to 20 to, to get all your senses back, but uh, sometimes even longer than that. But then he had another one at three months after that. So are you taking him to the doctor each time this is happening? Well, or? We, no, uh, we called the doctor when he had the next one and they said, that's OK, let's still wait and see. You know, uh, it's only been a year and a half, you know, but at the same time. It has been a year and a half, right? you know, so. <clears throat> yeah, because they said like when he was nine, I mean, if he's 14 and he doesn't have one, then he's out of the clear, right? So if he's having it in between, then he's not out of the clear. Yeah. So anyway, uh, like I said, he after that one at 18 months, then three months, he had another one. Then he didn't have another one for like six or eight months. And of course, his mother was a paramedic by trade uh, and dead set against medicating because of the fears of renal failure and all that good stuff that goes along with anticonvulsants. So uh, we, of course, I, being divorced and that whole ball of wax wasn't going to push that button if I didn't have to, right? So. Uh, this continued basically what they called a non-patternistic or lack of pattern situation with his seizures all the way up until, you know, he was 18 years old and driving. And, uh, I mean, and like I said, with they call him unpatternistic. Uh, literally, if you go at times 18 months, sometimes even longer in between and think, Oh, we finally, we were finally there, you know, and then wham, he'd have another one. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, and of course, you know, we took away the video games. We, we changed diet. We, we did all those other different things, trying to, trying to alleviate the possible external triggers. Nothing made any difference. So, uh, when he was 18, <coughs> Excuse me. He came to me because, uh, you know, now he's driving and he'd had a couple behind the wheel. Uh, luckily, both instances was on a back road. And he, you know, tore up barbed wire fence and his truck 
Yeah. But not himself or anyone else, luckily. No oncoming traffic, or I mean, he's like yeah. more I mean, rural. Yeah, yeah, he lived way out in the boonies, so that's good. Uh, luck would have it; nobody else was involved. But uh, it scared him, of course, sure. as it should have. And uh, of course, he asked his mom for help. She was still dead set against the meds, you know. And she basically told him, you know, well, if uh, you, you, you want to go down that road, you're going to have to go talk to your dad. So he did. And it, I mean, he didn't have to, but <clears throat> you got to understand an 18 year old kid. He didn't know which way to turn. Right. So sure. uh, he came and asked me and I said, OK, I'll help you. So we took him to the doctor, new doctor. And of course, we had to start at ground zero again. He didn't even have a, an MD. So we had to start with MD, get a referral, right? So we go to the neurologist. They do EEGs, MRIs, all that good stuff again. Still, no sign of epilepsy. And no sign of any other, like Ellers Danlos, or I mean, he doesn't have any symptoms of any other type of syndrome or disease or condition that causes seizures. So, I mean, no diabetes, no nothing. But they started him at that point on a low dose of what they call Keppra, which is a basic anticonvulsant medication. Uh, I've since found out a lot of people say, I don't know why they always start with that one. Uh, people that have had similar experiences as mine. And I said, well, I don't either, but seems to be that's, that's their go-to, right? So <laughs> they started him off on a low dose and uh, the ironic thing was the effect that it had, in, in my opinion, was the exact opposite effect of what it should have had. And there are those that will argue with me on that because there are, there are people in the medical field that I've had this conversation with that, that say, uh, well, it, it, it's supposed to control them. And he went from being unpatternistic to now having a pattern. And that is some kind of control. And I'm sorry. He went from having them maybe 18 months in between to now he was having them like clockwork every two months. That's what I was going to ask. Like, <clears throat> has the, did the pattern become more frequent? And if so, that's a problem. That's not good. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, he went from sporadic, it might be 18 months in between, to we're having them every two months. And so they left the dosage alone for, for six months. He went back to the doctor, reported, you know, what had happened. The, the, doctor's, uh, <laughs> the doctor's idea to, to remedy that was to increase the dose, which made them become more frequent. So six months down the road, they changed the medication and had the same effect. They became even more frequent. Have there been other patients that have experienced the same <coughs> adverse effect where it's more frequent, more patternistic? Yeah, it's actually, it's actually not that uncommon. And what's this medication called again? So it's the, C well, the, the first one was Keppra. Uh, yeah. I, I couldn't even begin to name all the different medications he took. He, he went through this process for five and a half years of wow. constantly changing medications every four to six months uh, to different medications, to doubling up on medications, to wildly increasing dosages, to, and of course, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the sad fact is uh, the downfall effects of the medications besides the possibilities of renal failure, which we already talked about, are lethargy. Uh, you gain weight. I mean, he didn't look like this when he passed away. This was before he started meds. Uh, how much, how was, much weight did he gain, would you say? He was probably pushing 350. Wow. When he, he passed looks, away, he looks 140, 160 in that. He was probably, probably about 150 in that picture. Wow. And that was his, when he was a senior in high school. Uh, and the, the difference is 
astonishing. But uh, at any rate, this obviously was not getting him anywhere. He was 100% dependent. At, by this point in time, he'd quit driving, you know. Uh, he was living on his own, self-supporting, worked full-time job. But he relied on everybody else to get him to and from work, to the store, to the doctor, wherever he needed to go. <coughs> so uh, it was probably the 1st of January of 2016. Uh, which he, he was 23 at the time. Uh, and he, he came to me and he said, you know, dad, he just, he came down for a weekend, uh, just come see dad, you know, and spend the night. We were sitting out in the garage just talking. And he said, you know, dad, uh, you hear all these stories about, about all this in California and, now in Colorado, and, you know, he's, he's, I can't help but wonder. Uh, and I said, what are you talking about, kid? You know, I spit it out. And he said, well, you know, uh, can't help but wonder if, if marijuana wouldn't help me. And just, I wonder if you knew, knew anything about it. And I was like, okay. <clears throat> and I said, well, uh, I got to be honest with you, kid. If you didn't figure it out growing up, I smoked that shit for 26 plus years every day, you know. <laughs> and, of course, he got a big laugh out of that. Uh, we talked a little bit. And at the time, I wasn't, wasn't smoking. I wasn't using cannabis in any way uh, because when – my lovely wife and I got back together. She had worked most of her life toward her retirement uh, for the Grayson County District Attorney's Office. And so I was actually, uh, a little sidebar real quick, I was actually over at the plug making a hookup and on my way back home. And I thought, you know, it really would not be good for her if I got caught with a bag right. of weed in the truck, absolutely. Yeah. You know, she's worked her whole life for her retirement. You know, I mean, I got no retirement because I've worked in construction like an idiot, but, uh, but I can't, I, you know, that wouldn't be right to take that away from her because of my habit, you know? So I gave it up and mind you, cold Turkey, no issue, no problem. Right. No withdrawal coming from someone who actually did, you know, get addicted to substance that probably did make you withdraw. So, yeah, I'm oh, glad I'll that tell you, you, you clarified that <laughs> the, the, the worst thing there is in addiction, as far as my knowledge goes anyway. And I know a lot of people who've dealt with addiction over the years. Uh, I've helped a lot of people who've dealt with addiction over the years. Uh, and and the, the hardest substance there is to quit is nicotine. Oh, I've heard over, that over over anything. Yeah. Um, well, but anyway, uh, back to my point. I quit. You know, I told him I, I wasn't at the time. I said, but you know, you you still got uncles who do. I've still got a long list of friends who do. So uh, I said, be honest. I said, I don't have a clue about the medicinal properties. You know, I know it's relaxing. I know it's calming. That's what it, what it did for me. <clears throat> I said, not much different than alcohol other than you can overdo alcohol and I've never been able to overdo smoking pot, you know. Uh, therefore, I can tell you one thing that I can tell you is it ain't going to hurt you. So if you, you want to go down that road, you want to try it, we can make it happen. All you got to do is say the word, you know, and excuse me I, at that point in time i mean this is my one regret at that point in time i wished i'd have started looking and researching uh because ultimately his decision was uh 
I mean, we talked about it probably three or four different separate occasions over a period of about six to eight weeks. And uh, the last time I brought it up, he just looked me square in the eye and he said, you know, dad, he said, thought about it. It's not just can't break the law to try it. And um, as a father who raised your kid to be a law abiding citizen, what do you say? You know, especially, I mean, I hadn't done any research, so I didn't know any more about it that day than I did the first day he came to me and asked me, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I didn't really think about it much after that point. Uh, but uh, we had no idea about something that we were about to learn about the hard way. We had no idea. There's this little thing called, uh, and I've known a lot of people in my lifetime who've dealt with epilepsy, you know, but we, we had no idea there's this thing called SUDEP, which is basically the abbreviation for what they call the sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, which mind you, uh, he finally, six weeks before he passed away, got a diagnosis of epilepsy. Oh my gosh. So uh, it's, I'm of the opinion that if he didn't have it before, the meds helped him get there, you know? Uh, but yeah, it was in June of 2016. I was sitting at work and uh, my phone started ringing. And the irony of that was, is it said it was him calling, but it was his big brother on the other end of the line calling me to tell me that they had found him and it was too late. Wow. Uh, he basically had gotten up to go to work one morning and uh, was getting ready to go to work. And they found him in the hallway outside his bedroom with one leg in his pants. So he was trying to get dressed when it hit. And uh, I mean, he, he, he lived about 30 minutes from where he worked. And he was 30 minutes late when his boss started calling because she knew, you know, I mean, he had, he had seizures at work. Right. Uh, she had everybody's phone number, including mine. <clears throat> Even though <clears throat> I was almost two hours away, uh, she still had my number in case she couldn't get a hold of anybody else. But uh, by the time anybody got there, it was it was late. too late. And and the, the medical examiner said it, that nobody would have been able to save him anyway. He basically was SUDEP or yeah, he was what they call status epilepticus, uh, was the medical examiner's terminology, which is basically when you seize and don't ever come out of it. Wow. And that was just before you said that they, he was finally diagnosed with epilepsy. Like in yeah, the last about week. six weeks prior to when he passed away, they finally said, Oh, there it is on an EEG. Gosh, man. Yeah. Uh, it's devastating. It was definitely, definitely a life changing moment, to say the least. Uh, what, what, what were, I mean, I can't imagine what you were feeling at that moment, what you're feeling even today, living with it, right? I'm curious to know what, what have you learned? Like you mentioned during that time, you didn't really like, research and understand the true efficacy of like how this plant can help someone who has epilepsy or seizures. So what, what research have you learned now? Um, and I guess what, what could have been done different if cannabis were part of the equation? 
Uh, I'm going to answer that in reverse. A lot. A lot. He would probably still be here today. That's just that there, there's no denying that fact. I mean, that's uh, what you hear, right? And with epilepsy, like Canada yeah. is one of the go to. I mean, like that's what's kind of one of the biggest medical breakthroughs that cannabis has seen is how it deals with epilepsy and seizures. Yeah, correct. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, to, to answer your question, I really have to kind of tell the story. Uh, that, that, that unwanted phone call was on a Monday morning. Uh, we had his service that Friday evening and, uh, or yeah, Friday evening. And then of course, you know, the church had a little get together for the family in the back afterwards. Uh, and it was probably about 10, 15 minutes before we were getting ready to hit the door. And uh, I was kind of sitting one side of the room at a table by myself. And uh, his mother come walking over. And she pulled the chair out across the table from me and she sat down and she just started talking. And <laughs> we hadn't talked in years, right? Definitely not friendly. But, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, she just... Uh, just started talking about about William and uh, at one point she said you know I tried to get him to try some marijuana and uh, for for a little context this woman doesn't even drink wine okay even if it's at church <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> That kind of flabbergasted me. So I'm like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> she goes, well, well, you know, I, I just brought it up to him and I told him, you know, I think uh, all these stories we're hearing about these wild success stories and whatnot, it's worth a shot, you know? So through that conversation, I figured out that she was actually the one who instigated him to come ask me. Mm. you know she knew because of your history and maybe you <laughs> well yeah it, she, it she somehow or yeah yeah she knew i smoked while we were together that wasn't a secret you know it wasn't like something i hid from her that she found out about at one point or anything right but uh she just disagreed with it sure but uh so we had an hour and a half drive from the church back here and uh the wife and I didn't say two words to each other the whole way home. I was just the wheels turning, wondering, you know, what is there to this? Because I hadn't seen anything, you know. Uh, I hadn't really paid any attention to all what was going on in California or Colorado. Or, so it meant nothing to me to look into it. Uh, but now I'm curious. Because if she's talking about it, there's got to be more to this than what I'm thinking. So uh, I got home, changed clothes, sat down here and uh, typed in the computer in the Yahoo search bar, marijuana slash epilepsy and hit enter. And uh, one of the first things that popped up was uh, Jack Harris book, Emperor Wears No Clothes. Yeah, we talked about that at the at the yeah. event, right? I mean, that was one of the first books that I really immersed myself with to really get educated around what's happening. I mean, there's a lot to learn from that book, right? It's right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but that popped up, and that, of course, that led me to the 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 first thing that really, because of course, I'm going at this strictly from the epilepsy perspective. I'm not looking for anything else. That's what I'm digging for, right? So that eventually led me to a, uh, basically a human study 
that was completed by Dr. Gene P. Davis and Dr. H. H. Ramsey right here in the United States of America that treated five epileptic children. And, and these five children, you know, some of them did have underlying conditions that, that were associated with their seizures, but uh, they, they all have been on whatever was available at this particular time. And that's the intriguing part of this study. Uh, because the point in time that this study was done, let me back up first, they had a better than 50% success rate wow. with these five epileptic children over and above the, the things that were about pharmaceuticals that were available in this day and age. And I keep, I keep referring to day and age because not only was this human study, which basically today would be called a human clinical trial, not only was it completed in the United States of America by American doctors, but it was completed in 1947 hmm. with a better than 50% success rate. The study was called the anti-convulsive activities of marijuana's active compounds. And if you're going to search for it, it's hard to find, but it's there. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll just say that reading that pissed me off. Like where, where, where was that information when you were seeking out help from the medical community? You know, they didn't where, know anything about it. It was yeah, buried. And it's, and, and, you know, to be fair, right. Like to their benefit of the doubt, like it's buried because it's not being taught in the schools due to the federal illegality and prohibition exactly. has taken place over a hundred years. Right. Exactly. I mean, exactly. It's not trained to look for that. Yeah. Or think about that. So, so, you know, that, that intrigued me to do more research and then more research. And then I started finding out the realities behind what was used, you know, and the reasoning behind why the things were used as tools to make cannabis illegal. Uh, and, and the original reason was simply greed, mm -hmm. you know, and industrial greed. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then pharmaceutical greed took over. <laughs> and right. of course, the thing, the tools they used were, were propaganda, tools, uh, propaganda and racism. Targeting. Yeah. Targeting minority groups mm -hmm. to then, you know, spread the demonization of the plant. When in fact, all they were really doing was protecting industry through greed. Yeah. And when I found when I found all this out, of course, that that uh, started to well up inside me. Uh, it, it was June thirteenth was the day he passed away. It was I think June twenty sixth when I created my Facebook page. Something has to change, and now and my YouTube channel. And I published my first video because now I'm thinking, I didn't know this. How many more people don't know this? Right. right. I, I got to put this out there. I got to, I started spending my own hard earned money on advertising on Facebook. You know, uh, I got up to over 150 videos that I put out where I was literally uh, some of them are me just ranting and bitching because people need to get involved, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, some of them, are, cause I get ticked off cause I do a video and point out, I mean, read literal studies, medical scientific studies and say, here's the evidence folks. And it'd get 2000 views. And then you, you remember the, the, uh, the, the black dude in McKinney, Texas, who recorded himself singing about his damn water burger, honey butter biscuit, chicken honey butter no. biscuit a few years back. Oh, the damn thing went viral. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, how in the hell can that go viral? And this not, you know, so there's some me 
videos of me ranting about stuff like that you know you, ha- you have a podcast too don't you grandpa's place actually i i, I well i do slash did kind of sort of uh i did a year ago a year ago this month i started a podcast called gramps place uh because uh i mean i i started my page on facebook i started making all those videos and then in 2018 i got involved with dfw normal and i started speaking publicly at their events uh started speaking at the the marijuana march in fort worth uh and then after that, I got involved with Texas Normal, started lobbying in Austin. I even went uh, with, with National Normal to Washington, D.C. in 2019, lobbied nice. in, in D.C. Uh, and then 2021 session was a whole different world, right? Because of COVID. Right. Which it closed some doors, but it also opened others. So I was able to sit here like I am with you and and record a video testimony and submit it from home so i didn't go to austin in 2021 which was already a massive letdown you know Mm -hmm. and then if if you've done any lobbying with with the legislative session in austin you know this and anybody else that has knows this as well once you go through that 120 day rumble and that's what it is. I mean, it's nonstop. You know, even if you get a meeting with your representative, which I have been lucky enough to do. Does that mean uh, that they're showing up? Well, they may even show up, sit down, <laughs> shake your hand, sit down and say, what are you here to talk about? And then they get a text to go, I'll be right back. And then they leave. And 15 minutes later, their, their staff member comes in and goes, he's on the floor and he's probably not going to be back for a couple of hours. <laughs> you can stay or you can go isn't it crazy that every two years and i know it's like this everywhere i mean or most most states right but two every two years they come together for all these major issues that the state needs to address and it's like all right let's cram it all in 120 days let's get it you know and it's it's nearly impossible i mean um it's insane again, what no they try to, to do yeah no fault to texas because again every state kind of has the similar similar legislative process but it just seems so crazy to me that um that it's like that but i want to hear your experience so like you know how how have the policymakers within texas responded to your testimony and and others you know with these types of compelling stories that you've lived firsthand well i uh you know, my rep here, here in Texas is a veterinarian by trade, you know? So he, uh, when I first met him, actually, it's kind of funny in 2019 was my first lobbying experience. Uh, so I had been in correspondence with his office prior to the first day, the opening, what they call opening day, which is, really just a bunch of pomp and circumstance, pictures and hoopla. No real lawmaking happens on that day, right? That's the photo shoot time. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but I made a point to be there and told them that I would be there on opening day. And so uh, I get there. Of course, I'm wearing a nice suit, tie, the whole ball of wax. And uh, the, uh, I walk into his office. There's a little little girl right there, desk right at the door. Can I help you, sir? And I see the guy that I've been communicating with at a desk behind hers. And I said my name to her, and his head pops up. And he just goes, hey, Chris, Jordan. And he tells her, I got, I got him, you know, and says, come on back. So I come back, and, and there's a chair at the end of his desk. I sit down, and we start having a conversation. The chair I'm sitting in is facing a hallway. And through that hallway door and immediately to the left is my representative's office. And he's in there talking to somebody, right? So my first thought is, okay, I know he's in here. Here's my opportunity, right? So I'm, I'm keeping this conversation going 
<laughs> as long as I can. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, needless to say, I keep it going long enough where my representative, which my representative is Lynn Stuckey, Mr. Stuckey and, and this person, whoever he is, some businessman, they get up and they're coming, coming out the door and they stop right in front of the chair I'm sitting in. And he's saying his goodbyes. And so as he reaches to shake this guy's hand and the guy, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll be in touch. As soon as he's releasing his hand and the guy starts to turn and walk away, I stood up. You grab him by the shoulder and you say, no, hey. I didn't you. have to. When, <laughs> when I stood up, I was literally, I mean, this close to him face to face. And, uh, of course, that prompted his legislative director, which is who I was speaking with, that prompted Jordan to jump up and introduce us. So now my foot's in the door, right? So. Uh, we literally had a 10 minute conversation right then. I told him, you know, Jordan told him about my son basically real, very briefly. And then we stood there and we talked about it and he's like, you know, well, uh, I'm, uh, which he's, he's Republican. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm a veterinarian. And I said, I, I know this. I live in Denton County. I know you're a veterinarian. I drive by your damn place all the time <laughs> that's what i'm thinking but i'm a veterinarian by trade and uh you know we you know we know that uh, when you're dealing with something animal that's that's having problems uh, and and the conventional methods don't always work then then it's time to start looking toward the unconventional and he said and they they teach you that in veterinary school you know to to explore things beyond what we're showing you here is you may figure out something nobody else has figured out you know and uh he says so you know i'm i'm all for the medical but uh you know we we got to be careful and i said okay uh do you mind if i ask you what you mean by we got to be careful and he said well you know we we got to be careful how we do it because you know, we, we got to make sure we do it in a way that, that not everybody's going to be doing it. And I just, I just looked at him and I'm like, you just don't get it, dude. You don't get it. <sighs> Number one, what you don't understand, my, my, my good friend is, is pretty simple. Uh, anybody who wants to do it already is. Right. <laughs> and our taxpayer dollars are continuing to fund people being incarcerated for nonviolent cannabis crimes. And they're being stuffed in these jails time and time again for these petty offenses. Not only that, human beings have an endocannabinoid system. So this plant naturally biologically marries to those receptors. So it is good because it's a, it provides homeostasis for the body. Uh, not to mention the environmental benefits of planting this, this plant, right? Because it enriches the soil yeah. and it sucks up so much CO2 and disperses. I mean, it goes on and on, but these, these officials don't know. So I get your frustration. I mean, his comment there, you're just like, dude, like, okay, I see where we're at basically. And, and you're, and that's, that's a lot level of, of understanding, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of the pushback still here in Texas from, from mostly the Republican side, but you still get it some from the Democrat, some of the Democrats too. Right. Well, um, I, I heard recently and it makes a lot of sense. Cause like, you know, what I, my viewpoint has always been, we're in Texas, you know, these, especially Republican led, these guys like making money, right. They're businessmen at the end of the day. So I always think, well, why would they not want to jump on this opportunity? But a lot of the lawyers that I've been hearing at these Texas hemp and Texas cannabis events, they're very clear in what they're saying. And it makes sense. They, the, the, the Republican party's position or these lawmakers position is they don't need the extra funding. Yeah. I mean, Texas makes so much money already. What is it like the seventh largest, like, I don't know, revenue generating state. I don't know. It's, it's, it's way up there, right. In terms of the amount of revenue is generated in the state. And so from yeah. what I've heard, it's like cannabis is kind of ignored because 
they just stick to the moral outlook of they think it's bad and it's crazy you know well it's uh, i think what is it the the fourth or fifth largest economy in the world that's right yeah that's texas right 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 yeah i think fifth or seventh something like that but yeah yeah it's crazy it's it's insane when you think about it from that perspective but yeah that that's what i was gonna say i i interviewed uh lisa Pittman Mm -hmm. on on my show uh back last year and that's what what she said texas doesn't need the revenue right which is crazy to me it's crazy to me um i just can't believe but what is what short-sightedness at the same time i mean what a what a short-sighted viewpoint to be like well we don't need the revenue and we don't need the innovation we don't need the job growth we don't need like come on guys well, like, how about this one We don't need a a police force that pansies out on the low-hanging fruit of cannabis users, (laughs) because in my opinion, that's what they do. You know, I have known personally people who work in that industry for my entire life, uh, you know, from all levels of the police force, and they'll tell you there's an awful lot of people in that line of work that that's the only only kind of police work they do. It's because just cannabis. It's easy. Yeah. And it and it pays the bills, right? I mean, that's ultimately, I'm sure there's a quota for how many tickets or you know, rests they make, and it's low-hanging fruit. You're right, because the majority of people do it. It's it's so sad, man. But I, I want to talk to you as we're as we wrap up, Chris. I mean, we've already, we've been talking for an hour and a half, and it's been a great conversation. I, I want to ask you, like, what if you could look into like, you know, if you could have that conversation again, not with just with Stucky, but like every lawmaker who's opposed to cannabis legalization in the state of Texas, like, you know, you got the floor, look in the camera. I want to hear what you would tell them, um, you know, as we wrap up. My number one thing, because I, I mean, I've done the research. I still see new things when they come out, but I'm not actively digging up research anymore and trying to put it out there because I've come to the conclusion that it's about one thing and one thing only. Um, And that thing is the fact that we have made these laws based basically 100% in lies. And, and uh, because of that fact, there are people that suffer in multiple, multiple ways through the incarceration or like my son's story who wanted to be a law abiding citizen, but had an opportunity for something that could have been a life saving medicine, or at least at the very least a life extending medicine, uh, because let's face it, we'll never really know because he didn't get the opportunity, right? And, and it's what I tell all lawmakers today is one simple thing. It's my goal to see to it that nobody else, no, no parent, no loved one of any way, shape, or form, even just a good friend, has to wake up every morning And the first thought is, what if? Because that's what I do every day. I wake up and think, what if? You know, uh, I mean, a lot of people ask me quite frequently, actually, if I ever get tired and think that maybe, you know, I'm going to quit. And yeah, the the truth to that is I will quit someday because someday my heart's going to stop beating but I hope I get to quit before that day comes because uh, no one should have to endure the loss of someone that they cared about, especially a family member or a child because laws were, were made based in lies because somebody wanted to make some money. And that's what it's, it's where all of this started. And the sad fact is we spend more money fighting it now than the money that was ever made back then. You know, uh, but that's my message to lawmakers. Don't, um, I, I had no idea, you know, I had no 
idea what could possibly happen. Neither do you. Do you want to be in the same shoes I'm in? Or do you want your loved ones to have every opportunity, including the opportunities mine was deprived? Well said, Gramps. Really, really appreciate you coming on and just sharing your, you know, your background, your your experience for what led you here today. And of course, sharing, you know, William's story. It, I know it's not easy and, uh, you know, having to relive it and talk about it, but it's, it's super helpful for others to hear um, because, you know, there's others that are going through this as well with, with, you know, the plant being federally illegal and us living in states like Texas. So, Really appreciate it. Keep up the great work. Uh, I really enjoy following you on Twitter. Tell people, yeah, as a matter of fact, your, your Twitter handle and where they can find you on social media if they want to you know, learn more. Well, I mean, on Twitter, it's just at Grisolia Chris. It's G-R-I-S-O-L-I-A-C-H-R-I-S. Uh, Instagram, it's, it's, I'd say I recently changed it because, I, I, like I started to say earlier, I had the podcast, but being I've just joined up with the Texas Cannabis Collective as treasurer, uh, I'm now going to be co-hosting on their Lone Star Collective podcast. Nice. So congrats. Not, not, not going to take mine down, but I probably won't have any new episodes for a while anyway. But uh, on, on Facebook, of course, it's Something Has to Change is Now, and Now is the page name. Uh, YouTube, it's just Gramps Place. Search Gramps Place, you'll find me. Uh, but it, mostly YouTube's kind of just gone by the wayside since I quit making videos. But, uh, <laughs> you know, Instagram is, uh, I think it's Grant, Chris Gramps, Chris Grisolia, I think is the, the handle now. Uh, I keep changing. Like I said, I keep changing it with <laughs> changing the podcast. Yeah, no, and I'll, I'll put the links in the description box so people can find it. But it is, it, I see it. It's Gramps underscore Chris underscore Grisolia. Yeah, yeah. I, th I thought that's what it was, but I wasn't 100% sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, man. No worries. No worries. Well, Chris, I really, again, really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, man, just keep blazing the trails. Keep keep uh, fighting the good fight because your voice is definitely being heard. And a lot of people really appreciate you sharing your story. Well, uh, that's my goal. You know, if, if there's any good that can come out of my tragedy, uh, and help someone else that, that makes it all the worthwhile. And I have had a lot of people over the last five and a half, six years, you know, come to me and tell me that, that we did, we had no idea until we found your page, you know, our, our daughter or son's life is so much better. So uh, yeah, I know I'm making a difference and that just, that just keeps driving me even further. Good. Absolutely. Well, keep doing it, man. It, it's making a difference. Thank you so much. And thank you all for listening. Bye. Bye. Thank you.